On the 4th of August, 2011, in Tottenham, North London, Mark Duggan was shot dead by police after the minicab he was travelling in was pulled over. The first news reports of the incident said that Duggan had opened fire, injuring an officer. Newspapers labelled him a gangster, implying that his death was justified. Two days later, the Metropolitan Police had still not contacted Duggan's family. Outraged, they led a protest to Tottenham Police Station, demanding answers. As their anger went ignored, the protest became confrontational, growing into the most widespread social unrest and police violence seen in the UK in a generation. Over the next four days, five people lost their lives and over 3,000 were arrested, resulting in almost 2,000 years of prison sentences. Duggan was being monitored by Operation Trident, a controversial police unit focused on gun crime in London's black communities. On the 4th of August, he collected a gun from Leighton in North London. He was being followed by officers from a specialist firearms unit known as CO19. When the minicab in which Duggan was travelling arrived here in Ferry Lane, Tottenham, officers carried out a hard stop forcing the minicab to pull over. Duggan stepped out of the cab and an officer known only as V53 shot twice. Killing Mark Duggan and injuring another officer known as W42. V53 later told investigators that he saw Duggan holding the gun in his right hand and that he felt his life to be in danger. But while a gun was found at the scene, it was found here, seven metres away from the site of the shooting. The gun was covered by a sock and no DNA evidence connected it to Duggan. Despite this, in 2014, an inquest jury returned a verdict of lawful killing. And a year later, the National Police Watchdog, the IPCC, concluded that Duggan had been holding the gun and was in the process of throwing it as he was shot. After an unsuccessful appeal against the inquest verdict, Duggan's family launched a civil claim against the Metropolitan Police, their last remaining legal avenue. Their lawyers commissioned forensic architecture to help them to examine the killing and to challenge the conclusions of the investigations that followed. Duggan's killing was a defining moment in London's recent history. But what happened and how it was investigated remains controversial. Even the judge who had overseen the inquest said, I was left with an impression of some uncertainty about precisely what was being investigated, on whose behalf, for what purpose, and by what means. At the heart of that controversy are two questions. Could Duggan have been holding a gun? And how did the gun get to the grass? We started by examining hundreds of publicly available documents, including witness statements, diagrams, and expert reports. We travelled to the scene of the killing and took photographs of every part of the site. Using a process called photogrammetry, we turned those images into a precise three-dimensional model. But with no video footage to rely on, we had to reconstruct the officers' movements from their testimonies. By analysing and cross-referencing their statements, we built a database which divides the incident into nine distinct moments from the perspective of each of more than a dozen different witnesses. From this database, we created a series of models reconstructing every stage of the incident. We then used plans drawn by witnesses 
to estimate the position of the two officers that were directly involved in the shooting. Lines of sight and other evidence narrowed down these areas. Somewhere in between was Duggan. To work out where, we created a precise 3D model of his body. Pathology reports describe the location of the gunshot wounds. The first shot went through his right bicep, grazing the right-hand side of his chest. The second shot passed through his chest, exiting through the lower left-hand side of his back. These lines tell us how Duggan would have been positioned at the time of the first shot and at the time of the second shot. Modelling his jacket gave us more details about his body position. These holes near the left-hand pocket suggest that at the time of the second shot, Duggan's jacket was folded back on itself, with his left hand across his chest. Before examining whether he could have been holding a gun in his hand, we used this information to recreate Duggan's movement during the period of the shots. After exiting the minicab, Duggan turned toward V53. His left hand was in or near his left pocket, and his right hand was reached across his waist. He began by moving his right foot away from the minicab at an angle of around 22 degrees. As his left foot followed, he was struck by the burst bullet, which passed through his right bicep and hit W42 in his underarm radio. Duggan's right foot came across his left as he stumbled. His left arm moved up across his chest. His torso bent forward as he was hit by the second bullet, which continued through the open door of the minicab. Here's that sequence again in real time. According to our analysis, from Mark Duggan exiting the minicab to receiving the second fatal shot, no more than one and a half seconds had elapsed. According to the IPCC, sometime during that period, Duggan threw the gun with enough force to land seven metres away. A new study by biomechanics expert Dr Jeremy Bauer told us that to travel that far, the gun would have to be thrown at an angle of between 31 and 40 degrees, at about 6.7 metres per second. At the inquest, V53 described the gun in Duggan's hand in detail. He said, I can make out the trigger guard, I can make out the barrel, and it's side on to his body, and there's a black sock covering that weapon. But he also said that he didn't see Duggan throwing the gun. He told the inquest, It would clear up a hell of a lot of stuff if I was able to say, yes, I saw the gun fly through the air and it landed wherever. But I didn't see it. V53 was standing around three metres away from Mark Duggan, looking directly at him. If he could describe the gun in such detail, is it possible that he missed it being thrown? What would the scene look like from V53's perspective? First, here is his view without a gun in Duggan's hand. Then, with Duggan throwing the gun, at different moments. Before the first shot. After the first shot. And after the second shot.
But a human's field of vision is not like what we see on a computer screen. Our central vision is highly sensitive to details, while the periphery is more sensitive to movement. The result is impossible to perfectly represent on a flat screen. So in order to simulate the vision of witnesses, we recreated the entire scene in virtual reality. Experiencing the scene in this way confirmed for us that in each scenario, the required throwing motion would have been clearly visible to V53, given where the officer said he was looking. In fact, it is unlikely that Duggan could have physically made such a motion. The forensic pathologist commissioned by the IPCC, Professor Derek Pounder, said, I cannot conceive of how Duggan might have thrown the gun. He made this conclusion despite having been asked by the IPCC to assume that Duggan had been holding the gun when he was shot. Dr. Bauer, the biomechanics expert, also concluded that It is unlikely Mr. Duggan could have thrown the gun after he was shot in the arm. If Duggan didn't throw the gun at that time, there are only two alternatives. Either Duggan threw the gun as he exited the minicab, or the gun was moved by police officers. In both cases, Duggan would not have been holding a gun when he was shot and would have posed no threat to the police. In 2014, the inquest jury concluded that, more likely than not, Mark Duggan threw the firearm as soon as the minicab came to a stop. To test this theory, we needed to understand how the hard stop could have played out. The inquest was shown a video in which CO19 officers practiced a hard stop. Multiple officers described the Ferry Lane incident as a textbook hard stop. So we applied those timings to our animated model. The rear windows of the minicab, a Toyota Previa, did not open, so Duggan could not have thrown the gun until the minicab came to a stop and he opened the door. But if Duggan had thrown the gun at this point, would it have passed through the field of vision of any of the officers? We identified four officers who would have been best positioned to notice the gun if it was thrown at the moment that Duggan exited the vehicle. We replayed the scene from the perspective of those four officers. V53. W70. W56. and W42. None of these officers said they saw the gun being thrown. In fact, W42 told the inquest, There is no way Mark Duggan could have thrown the gun from the minicab and me not see it. while V53 said that he watched the door of the minicab slide open and kept his eyes on the open door. The verdict of the inquest jury, which was also rejected by the IPCC, requires that not just one, but at least four officers failed to notice the gun being thrown. With every additional officer who missed it, this scenario becomes less likely. This makes it even more important to consider the final possibility, that officers moved the gun after Duggan was shot. The aftermath of the shooting was filmed from the ninth floor of a nearby building 
by a member of the public known as Witness B. Their footage is 15 minutes long and begins around 40 seconds after the shooting. Based on this footage, the IPCC rejected the possibility that the gun had been planted, saying, There is no sign of any officer planting a firearm on the grass. And also, There is no evidence any person entered the rear of the minicab. But these statements are misleading. Let's take a look at the first claim. Witness B's footage is very low resolution. Would it even be possible to see a gun in the footage at this distance? We introduced a model of a gun into the scene. Then we applied filters to recreate the resolution of the footage, demonstrating that the gun wouldn't be visible in the video at this distance. However, the footage does show us how the officers moved around the scene so we can examine the IPCC's claim that there is no evidence that any officer entered the rear of the minicab. Witness B's footage is shaky, so first we stabilise the video so that stationary objects like the cars stay in the same place in the frame. This made it easier to identify individual officers and to track their movements around the scene. We assigned a code name to each officer until we could work out who they are. For example, the officer known as Q63 is identifiable because of his white t-shirt. Then we mapped the areas that would have been hidden from Witness B's camera. When officers drop out of sight within this red zone, behind the minicab and Charlie car, they could potentially have entered the minicab and retrieved the gun. We tracked how Q63 moved around the scene. Whenever he is partly or fully hidden in the red zone, his track turns red. Whenever he is visible, the track is white. We turned this tracking into a timeline and repeated this process for each of the other officers. This meant we could see when any officer was partly or fully hidden behind the minicab and Charlie car. In total, officers entered this zone more than a dozen times, but the IPCC did not examine these moments in any detail. These moments don't tell us that the gun was moved by police officers, but they do show that, based on the footage alone, the IPCC has no grounds to rule out the possibility that any officers entered the rear of the minicab. We mapped dozens of possible chains of connections by which the gun could hypothetically have been carried from the minicab to the grass. Here is a demonstration of one of them. At the time the gun was officially recovered, seven minutes and 28 seconds into Witness B's footage. Two officers, known as Z51 and R31, were standing on the green, where the gun was reportedly found. They can be seen in this photo, taken by a member of the public from the other side of the park. A few seconds later, R31 walks towards the location where the gun was found. If we follow R31's movements backward through time, we can see that two minutes earlier, he passed close to Q63. And around 40 seconds earlier, Q63 disappeared within the red zone for 12 seconds. This alone does not suggest that Q63 moved the gun from the minicab. But the IPCC cannot use Witness B's footage to rule out that possibility. 
the IPCC's investigators didn't only misread the evidence, the experts also failed to identify and examine something potentially important, a clear cut in the footage. Before the cut, we see Q63 on the right of the minicab. After the cut, Q63 is on the left. In order to estimate the duration of this gap in the footage, we use the movements of another officer, Z51. He is moving at a steady pace before the cut and afterwards. Studying his walking speed along a likely path between the two points, we estimate that the duration of the missing footage is at least four seconds. This is potentially long enough for Q63 to access the minicab. This is important because two seconds later, Q63 gestures towards the green and seems to communicate with Z51. But neither the inquest nor the IPCC noticed this cut or examined its importance. As we have seen, the gun could have arrived at the grass by three possible routes. The route preferred by the IPCC is not consistent with the available spatial or biomechanical evidence. The route preferred by the inquest jury requires at least four officers to have missed the gun being thrown. And the final route was not fully investigated by either. In September 2019, our investigation was instrumental in helping the family's lawyers to negotiate an out-of-court financial settlement with the Metropolitan Police. And in November of that year, we presented our findings publicly for the first time in Tottenham, less than a mile from where Duggan was killed. What you saw here today, people, was us unravelling and unpacking the lies that were told in that inquest. Some people say to us, why do you fight for justice? And I say, well, what choice do you have? 